and welcome to Faces for Equality, where we focus on benevolent work from around the world and the humanitarian faces behind them. I'm your host, Lauren Collins. <laughs> or maybe it's just the quarantine starting to get to me. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Like, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to kind of fill in some of the pieces with from our last conversation um, about on the move art studio, and I guess I will begin with where are you at now? How how has COVID, or if it has COVID nineteen, has it affected you with? what you're able to do, um, are there any limitations? And how do you personally feel during this space of your life, our, all of our lives? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, just like with any other like school related thing or kids related thing, um, we're, our program is suspended. Um, so it started happening kind of incrementally. The first to go was actually our program at the Juvenile Detention Center. Um, they were one of the first um they were very proactive they sent out a thing saying hey um no more visitors no more outside programming no more nothing until this clears and we used to go to the juvenile detention center every friday to do arts classes with the kids in there oh um, amazing yeah so it's five classes a day um and we've been doing it for over a year so that was kind of the first thing to go. Then some of the schools we work with started closing. And then it kind of hit that tipping point where it was like, ooh, we should just, we don't want to be the only one doing programming, you know, and, and for the safety of everybody, um, we suspended our programming. So as of right now, we're, we're not doing anything. So um, in terms of serving kids, there's been a few things where we've kind of partnered a little bit and have organized some um, art supply boxes. Um, I put this thing, there's this group called Lexington Mutual Aid, um, where it's like people putting what they need and people putting what they can give. So I said, hey, if anybody needs any art supplies during this time, you know, let us know. And there were about 10 people that reached out. So I put together little kits and then just like dropped them off um, for people. Um, that's, good. that's everything already was cool. to be able to express like the creativity still um, during a time in which we're trying to find ways to create and be creative when we um, are lacking the space <laughs> like when it comes to being confined to your actual space or um, not able to be in a brick and mortar like a school or you know a mobile home or whatever it is that provides you that extracurricular it's so amazing to hear that you found that way to still have the donations and to help people that now are at home um, why do you, how is that going I mean it's, it's really cool um, you know I wish we could do more but then it's this tricky thing of like if we go out and buy more supplies then we're, we're in kind of a financial tricky situation because a lot of our fundraising comes from like public events where, um, you know, they're birthday parties, they are canvas painting nights. There's, there's essentially, basically a lot of our fundraising comes from events that have humans at them. Right. And so now that there's not, there's no chances to have humans. So we've lost about $7,000 so far um in different like fundraisers and things that we had lined up so it's been a bummer uh for sure um so yeah as of right now i'm just trying to use this time to like organize some things apply for some grants um we've had a couple of our employees who were like art instructors they've uh gone on unemployment um because there's no more classes, you know, they, they were only paid to like teach classes. And I, I wish we could pay them to do other stuff, but grants work, we, we can't. But Kentucky's actually been really great at like the unemployment system and getting people the help they need. Um, so yeah, as of right now, we're not doing anything. So 
sad well, times. I'm so sorry to hear about like the deficit and um, the very real implications that like COVID-19 has affected it. I'm just going to call it pandemic. <laughs> um, that this yeah. pandemic has like had this trickle down process um, for such amazing initiatives. And um, because our users have yet to hear about the full entity of your initiative, your program, your company, or everything. Um, can you explain? Can you do us the honor in explaining what On The Move Art Studio is? Yeah, totally, yeah. So um, On The Move Art Studio is a nonprofit. Uh, we go to low-income neighborhoods and underserved areas and provide free arts classes for children. Uh, we use a trailer, an old vintage trailer that we renovated into an art room. Um, so we've been around for a little over four years. And so we've served about 32,000 kids so far um, in central Kentucky. Um, and so, yeah, we that's, that's what we do. Um, we It's free what we do and we do it by request. So like one major thing that's really important to me that we do is we don't show up uninvited. Um, a lot of times in community work, people can go into neighborhoods thinking they're gonna save them. It's like you and I talked about them, like, oh, these people need saving. We just say, hey, everybody, we exist. Let us know if you want us to come. If you think this is an appropriate resource for the kids in your neighborhood, let us know. And by that approach, we're booked out like two seasons in advance. So by February, our spring and our summer were 100% booked. Um, so that part is important to me because again, in this kind of work, people sometimes impose things on people and we wanna make sure we don't do that. We just say, hey, call us up, you know, if you, if you want us to come. Um, so that's been, it's, it's totally community driven. Um, so that is a little bit about On The Move Art Studio. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, everything that you're doing, that you're up to, and everything that will resume in due time um, on the other side of the pandemic. But also, I love your point, and this is something I've just learned now, um, about the upon request. I think that is so niche and very beautiful that you guys have clocked that as the way in which you provide your resources because I have heard and um, studied and seen in some of my understandings that it's a very like um, you can get kind of trapped in that whole like savior aspect when it comes to charity work and not in all cases yeah. in most cases the intentions are like so amazing um, it's just a unfortunate downside or downfall in some cases for some organizations that had a really good um mind and heart you know with their organization however um the fact that yours is upon request it kind of negates that aspect where it's like oh no <laughs> you've requested us and i really love this that is something that's unlike anything i've heard thanks yeah i mean and and the other part what we try to do too is so there's some stuff that can be requested but then what happens is there's so much red tape so coming from a social work aspect one of my goals was like, all right, we're going to create this resource. People can ask us to come, but we're also going to make the barrier to access very, very, very low. We're not going to have you fill out 20 forms and then send us proof of ID and proof of income and all this kind of stuff. If you determine that your neighborhood benefit from this, then we're going to come as long as we can have, as long as we have it in our schedule, you know, an opening in our schedule. But that's the other thing is that some resources out there are so difficult to obtain. It makes the attempt to get them almost in vain. Some people are like, oh, what's the point? I'm going to be on hold for three hours. Uh, I mean, sometimes I even thought about like, so I teach at UK and, and I have social work students and I thought about making it a homework assignment to call the food stamp office just to feel what it feels like sometimes you're on hold for three hours and then you get somebody who's like rude to you wow so the point being like you know we didn't want it to be this very inaccessible thing we wanted to be like all right if you need it and we can be there we'll be there um I so mean, 
genuinely my hat or beanie as I'm presently wearing is so off to you because that is phenomenal and you're so right like it's so hard to remove bureaucracy out of most things um and politics is like always intertwined somehow um but to lessen that kind of build up and also exacerbation on some of the systems but also the problems that lie within uh these structures ah oh, that's everything because people just need it to be easily available the things that are important and your organization is so important for um communities and i really like hearing that this is made possible with so much less red tape if any because that's everything and you're so right we we've <laughs> all been on the line with like banks alone for ages and it's like well who's serving who <laughs> i thought america yeah. was like all about the customer service experience but um yeah. it gets very tested in our <laughs> ideas yeah. <of> that. <laughs> totally yeah. So, yeah 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 so that's so neat to hear and actually it Thank reminds you. Yeah, you're welcome it reminds me of something that i wanted to ask you as well when you were saying your social work class so can you speak a little bit more if possible on how your social work background first of all i guess telling the audience about your social work background but how it per um kind of intertwines and relates to how you are able to start this organization on your own and just what helps you in the understanding Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So my actual background is social work. Um, so I have my master's degree in social work. Um, so I'm the co-founder of On The Move Art Studio. Kathy Working is the co-founder with me. So I'm the social worker. She's the artist. Um, so Kathy is an incredible uh, local artist. Um, and so together we kind of brought our skill sets. So I had a lot of um, a, a decent amount of uh, knowledge about how to start a nonprofit you know I actually part of my master's program was I had to take a class called nonprofit management so um there was that aspect of of learning about how to start a nonprofit um legally um and then my other concentration was family and community development so there's a lot of studies in like um how to create resources for large amounts of people uh So just trying to bring that kind of aspect of, you know, a big part of social work when you're a social worker, you're essentially trying to find resources for people. You're trying to connect people with the resources they need to be self-sufficient and thrive. And um, you know, I kind of based on the way I grew up, this was kind of a dream of mine was like, all right, when I get to a certain age, I would like to create a resource for people um because i started noticing like we just talked about there's either a not resources available or b the resources are so hard to get to so i was like all right well we're going to fix that um so that's kind of how yeah yeah and just trying to bring in um so again with social work you're taught not to be paternalistic you don't want to decide for people what they need um so i try to bring that into what we do um so we just try to listen a lot we try to see where we can fit in to the puzzle of community work and um contribute where we can Hi, it's me Lauren with Faces for Equality. I'm speaking with special guest Josh Nadzem on On the Move Art Studio. Thank you so much for tuning in so far and tune in for more. Again, <laughs> I'm wearing so many hats to tip off and <laughs> and your Oh, no, please. So that's absolutely incredible. Um Thank that's you. a dream because you have found a way to use your academic background and also what is exuding from you, your passion and make it into something that betters the world, the community. And I get that from you and your personality and knowing you. but also it's so amazing to know that it's represented in an organization that does right by children and the community and who doesn't like that <laughs> so that's thank you so thank you yeah we try we we can do a lot better but but i appreciate what you're saying thanks for it of course <laughs> um and so with that actually 
on who you are as a person. Um, <laughs> not going sure. to overanalyze you, but yeah. how would you say that, like you as an individual, plays into what you were able to create? Like, what inspired you to begin this type of adventure? Yeah, I say. I mean, the main thing was um, kind of like I alluded to. So I in my head these aren't just like kids we're serving these are kids who grew up like i did so the the neighborhood i grew up in was uh, very poor um, lots of drugs lots of crime uh, i come from a very broken family um, my family has has you know grown up had a lot of issues with addiction and poverty and domestic violence and um, the first 18 years of my life were, were chaos basically uh, it was a lot of bad stuff that happened pretty much the way I remember each year is like what traumatic thing happened um, that year um, so it was just kind of like uh, my hope was like if I ever make it out of this I would like to create something that could help kids who grew up like me um, because while everybody's experience is unique um, I can at least relate somewhat to what they may be going through um, so I know when you live in a neighborhood, so like I remember realizing when I got older, some of my friends, their parents would say, don't you go to that neighborhood or you're grounded. And it's an interesting thing. And, and I think that's the right call. They shouldn't have come to my neighborhood. But it's a weird dynamic to know that like you live in the very neighborhood that other kids get punished if they go to. It's like, oh, wow, this is what I open the door and walk out into every day. And it could have always been worse. I don't want to like exaggerate it, but uh, it was it was bad. It was just a lot of things that I wish I didn't see. Um, so I think that that has always stuck with me and is, has made this very personal um, and very urgent. You know, it's it's not just like a cute idea that will look cool on social media. It's like no, this is like what I really want to do. Um, and here's how we're going to do it. And I'm not going to go away until we do it. <laughs> so, oh, well, yeah. thank you for sharing that with me and with our viewers. And um, yeah. importantly, I, um, as a friend, friend to friend, I'm proud of you and everything that you've overcome because I can only imagine um, how that wasn't easy. And um, it's definitely very lucky and hard earnest we earned that you are a really strong individual um, considering everything that you overcome so, thank you I appreciate that of course you're so welcome don't even don't even <laughs> <laughs> um, well fine <laughs> I'm turning more and more British nowadays where like I don't accept compliments well I'm like oh god <laughs> that's like a thing that <laughs> Um, You're saying you, you don't accept compliments well? Yeah, which is like a stereotypically like British thing and maybe I've just been around it a lot after like always being like, oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you to my peers and you're amazing and all. And of course some people like, they're like, oh wow, well, thanks. But it's a stereotype that it's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> like, please stop, like, what is this? <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah. Well, it's especially interesting because you were complimenting me and I, I just said, you know, thank you. And, and so you're saying, like, even that was too much. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thanking you for your compliment. So, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, oh, no. That's fascinating. <laughs> but you're welcome. <laughs> I was kidding. So I also um, was wondering, how do you, hmm, let's see, because everything that you went through, um, does it give you any, I'm trying to think of how to work this, sorry. Um, did you have fear of going into it? Like, did you feel like anything in your upbringing or you as a person, what you've gone through, for better or for worse, were there any things that made you feel like you would have to overcome um, when starting your own organization? Or did it just give you the like veracity to keep going yeah, like kind of speak on that if that's anything. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, 
I'd say it's a couple things. I'd say one is, in a weird way, I never had a doubt that this would work. And, and I don't mean that in like an arrogant way. I just meant that like, I believed in this so much that I knew that no matter what happened, I would just find a way to like make it work um, in the most persistent way. So like, I never doubted it for a second that this was the right thing to do. Um, but then just personally, I knew that in the pursuit of this, there would be several things I'd have to overcome. So just, uh, you know, um, different things like, you know, when I, I, I realized like when I would be in a room full of like very wealthy individuals, I would immediately feel very inadequate. Um, it would kind of just overwhelm me. I, I, I would go back to these, you know, you and I were talking before about like labels and stuff. And in my head, I had this self-label of white trash. You know, growing up with Project Section 8, Sam's welfare, most of my friends are on drugs or they're dead. And I think I grew up with the notion in my head of like, oh, I'm just white trash. Mm -hmm. And it would be easy to kind of like ignore that. And so I was in a room full of people that to me represent the opposite of that. You know, rich people in suits, very distinct, very proper. And in my head, I would kind of think like, oh, you're just this Josh kid from the projects. You shouldn't be here. So I knew that I'd have to like, that was going to be a thing. And, and it still sometimes happens, to be honest. And I have to remember to like, talk that down and remember like, that is just a concept in my head that I've created. Um, so there's things like that, that kind of pop up. Um, you know, with with that, um, and then also just uh, not doubting myself. So, like, while I never doubted the idea of this, sometimes I would doubt myself. Like, it's kind of like uh, climbing up a mountain, and you're doing great, but then you look down, and you're like, "Oh crap!" So every once in a while, I would metaphorically look down and realize, like, "Oh wait a minute." Should I even be the person who's speaking in front of these 200 people? Um, should I even be the person who's meeting with the CEO of the bank? And, you know, and so that, that was something, and still sometimes I have to slow that down when there's doubts creep in. So, um, yeah, I'd say those are some of the things that I uh, encounter that I have to overcome. That's phenomenal um, and beautiful analogies as well. I feel like so many people, myself included, could definitely relate to that type of feeling of being like, you know, yeah, let's do this. And then you're doing it and you're like, am I, am I all right to do this? Like, um, <laughs> yeah. am I worthy yeah. of doing this? Or just kind of like, um, how can I have people believe me that I'm the one to be able to do this? But so important to like, know that like, you've got this, <laughs> literally. Yeah, it would be this weird thing of like, uh, I would chase what I'm passionate about and just just freaking go for it because I believe just leaving the net will appear. If you believe in it, go for it, do it. So I would do that. Um, and then it would be like, I'd be doing the thing and then people would be like, hey, we like that thing. We're going to support you. We're going to follow you. And then it would get to the point where I would kind of look up and be like, wait a minute, why do these people see me as a leader? Oh God, I'm not a leader. No, I, no. Um, so it's just this ironic cycle, like go do the thing. People say, hey, we like that thing. We want to support you. Then I'm like, okay, great. Thanks. So like, wait a minute. Why are you supporting me? Like, I'm not, you know, so just having to, to recognize that, that like, whoa, that's, it's wild so <laughs> no that's really yeah. well said um and thank you for sharing that what do you feel like when you're like wait a second and looking on either side of you do you feel like your so the audience doesn't know this but you are an athlete uh, josh is an athlete everyone <laughs> really good <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> he is like a track star uh genuinely and so i i definitely i think that your like some of your motivation and your tenacity like must come from that element in you that like allows you to be so good at what you do on the, the field as well um but do you feel like as a, you personally feel like your sports and the athleticism and the mind that you developed from 
and all of it. Does that help you overcome knowing that like you've got this Josh? Like, does it kind of seem like it's like a yin and yang? Like it works together. It's different, but it works. <laughs> yeah, I, it's interesting that you asked that because I've thought about that a lot before. It's like, um, so I grew up, you know, playing football and basketball and especially in football, like in football, you are just pummeled with the idea of like, fight through the pain and like give it a thousand percent you know same thing with running track and field um so in a way i've have essentially applied that same kind of thing sometimes to my own detriment where like i would put so much effort into this thing that some days i would just be utterly exhausted but i always felt like i could push past whatever limit there is um so it was basically like, all right, well, I'm not a football player anymore, but I'm going to apply the same principles to this thing. Um, so I think in some ways it's definitely helped, um, for sure. Uh, oh, that's really encouraging. And I'm sure there's, um, I mean, we know there's so many um, young girls and boys and men and women um, that are into sports. Uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, and knowing that you can use this, like if you didn't become the, you know, professional athlete that you had dreamt of, myself included, I thought I was going to be a soccer star by now, but <laughs> shifted the dreams. But um, yeah. internalizing the things that I've learned and kind of looking in, oh yeah, sure, if I can use it to help with a vision and idea, then sure. And it's um, neat to hear that like yours has affected the work that you do and the ability to overcome some of the fears and the struggles that um, you might have been faced with. That kind of competitiveness as well is like really nice, I feel like, for being able to put that into your passion without competitiveness separating people because as you and I have discussed in our previous conversation, um, collaboration is so great. <laughs> um, and so actually speaking on that note, how do you feel about others wanting to start an organization and worrying about similarities of other organizations or just not having someone steal your ideas or maybe it's not even stealing but just kind of feeling like all the things are out there already and how your idea and vision can contribute at a time when we have access to so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think, I don't know, I, I have a couple thoughts on that. One is like, first and foremost, like you said, collaboration is key. And you want to make sure you're partnering with people who are already doing the work. Because there is a limited amount of dollars out there for nonprofits. Um, you know, if there's a domestic violence shelter that has existed for 40 years and they do great work, um, it might be better if you partner with them versus starting your own shelter um, because there might not be just enough money to go around to start your own shelter. So I think, yeah, not, in re not re reinventing the wheel um, and making sure like you listen to your community, like what is available in our community and what gaps exist. On that same notion, I, I, I've thought about this a lot. This is gonna be kind of a weird comment and probably not very popular, but I think about it like, Right now, Lauren, if you were like, hey, I want to start a t-shirt company, nobody would ever be like, hey, Lauren, actually, there's already Adidas and Nike, like, there's already enough t-shirt companies out there, so, no. So, I wonder, like, in the same way with nonprofits, I, I, I understand, like, you don't want to compete or, or whatever, but there could never be enough help. So, I don't while I think collaboration is key, if somebody is out there doing the idea, it doesn't mean like, oh, there's, there's already one of those, there can't be any more. So I'd say like, there's like a, a balance there somewhere where you can collaborate, but don't be afraid to still go do the thing because the other thing is you might do it better than them. And, and the question becomes, why don't poor people deserve choices? Like if somebody came up with another mobile art studio here in Lexington and they did it better than us and blew us out of the water, I'd be like, you know what? That's a bummer. 
but the kids are getting a higher quality service, so we yield to them. When there's no competition, then that means people in poverty have one thing to choose from. And what if it's crappy? So it, it, it's a, the reason the, I have this thought, but again, like it's not the um, it's not the traditional talking point. You know, like I've I've never actually heard anybody say that, so I'm I'm almost reluctant to say that. Yeah. Because everybody <laughs> normally goes to the collaboration and you know don't reinvent the wheel, which I totally agree with. But I've also had this other thought of like, hey, poor people deserve choices too, and competition makes us better. So like my track coach at UK, Don Weber, he got me to really think. Um, he, he loved this one quote that says, I love my competitors because they bring out the best in me. So like, if there was another mobile art studio that popped up, we would probably think, oh, okay, well, if we're both applying for this grant, we need to step our stuff up, which then the kids benefit from. If everybody's trying to improve their services, that's good. So again, it might not be the popular thing, but I think it's okay to, to try for something that already exists because again, what if you can do it better, you know? This is Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. I'm scared. No, this is so wonderful. I'm really glad that you said it. This is something that I could hear all day long and maybe others feel the same way because like what you said, there are different ways to think of it. And though yours might be not as orthodox, it's so unique to hear the other side of being like, wait a second, you're right, you know, and just being like, wait, who is um, kind of holding the monopoly on t-shirts or concepts or ideas? Like that shouldn't be the case. Yeah, like imagine this, imagine how screwed up this would be. We've been in Lexington for four and a half years doing free arts classes for kids. Imagine some, up and coming young woman has this idea and she's like, I want to do that too. Imagine if we were like, um, excuse me, miss. I say I can't even say it without laughing. Um, excuse me, miss, but uh, we already do that. So if you could just not do that, that'd be cool. Then what happens is it becomes about us, like the ego, like uh, we already do that. So therefore you should not pursue that. That would be, in my opinion, kind of toxic. The, the utopian approach would be, hey, young adult, that's awesome. Um, let's see if we can collaborate, uh, but go for it. There should be 17 mobile art studios everywhere. There should be 45 per neighborhood. Um, so again, sometimes I, I think there's a, there's a temptation to make it about yourself. Like, I started this and nobody else will ever duplicate what we're doing. No, just like chill out. Like, what's it really about? Is it about the people or is it about yourselves? You know? Well said. I want <laughs> to be like, preach. Like, that's so true. I don't know. I, I'm certain right. that there's so much truth to that. I feel like that's really refreshing, actually, to hear that, like, okay, you know, ideas can be uh, something to come into fruition and, you know, it can become the organization that you've always dreamt of or. Your idea can be more than just on paper. It can like speak volumes and it can affect change. And these kinds of things I'm getting from what you said, it doesn't just like kind of stamp it out altogether as, nope, already done. That's gonna be the case for everything. I mean, even music is often repeated in different ways when it comes to the actual components of the sound that's been on repeat for like centuries. <laughs> Um, yeah. Similar thing with film, you know, working with also what works and concepts or ways that we think of things. So I really like that. I'm glad that you said. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like what you're saying, I mean, we could have a whole separate discussion of who owns the thought. Like, if, if I say the words, the tree is green and tall, like, do I forever own those four or five words? You know, like, I don't know. I mean, you don't want to like flat out copy what somebody's doing and market it as your own and, and plagiarize, but also like who owns the thought, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I've heard this debate in music and stuff too. Like you're saying, it's like, 
eventually, in theory, there is a limit to how many words we can arrange. And you're going to run out of, like, you can only say, the woman is so pretty 20 different times. Then eventually you're like, oh, wow, okay. There's no way of it, you know. Pretty woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty woman, woman pretty. Dang it, take girl it. Girl pretty. <laughs> yeah. You're so yeah. right. I really like that. Thank you. <laughs> Basis for equality. Yeah. Um, actually, speaking to that type of understanding of like wait a second there's so many different ways to go about this and to think of things and to expand great ideas to help people and communities um how would you say that your particular um, organization is unique to the area unique to to you to other ngos out there i mean i'm biased i find it to be insanely unique and just so brilliant. I've never heard of anything like it. I absolutely love it. It's genius. Um, but you, what's you. your, you're welcome. What's your <laughs> on the uniqueness of your organization? Yeah, I, I guess just the, um, you know, what has allowed us to be successful is the, the mobile approach, which was not our plan. Um, we were actually trying to start an art center, a physical brick and mortar center. And it was going to be a replication of a, a, another art center in Pittsburgh. And um, we couldn't raise the money to do that. So they were like, all right, what if we start small? What if we start something mobile? Um, and that's kind of how that got started. Um, but yeah, we quickly realized that like you could have the most beautiful center in the world, but if kids can't get to it, then what, what's the point? And we all know how complicated traffic is and transportation. Um, so I think that's what I guess would perhaps earn us the title of unique is that we try to eliminate that barrier of transportation. We just bring the programs directly to the kids. So we'll do classes inside our trailer, um, in front of the trailer, in parks, in churches, in schools, in juvenile detention centers, basically anywhere we can occupy a space. Um, we will do the classes. And I think also from a funding standpoint, you know, if you donate to us, um, we don't have like a giant building that we have to pay a lot of money to upkeep. So our overhead is much smaller than most organizations because, again, we don't have a, a bunch of buildings and bathrooms to maintain and utility bills to pay. Um, so I'd say that's hopefully what, what allows us to say we're unique. <laughs> Amazing. It's such an interesting um, way that you guys have come about. That's so unique. Wow. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Like my mind's going in a different direction, like a thousand different directions. <laughs> because I'm just like, whoa, like if one thing doesn't happen, like keep it going, you know, and I'm just feeling really motivated by what you've said. And I hope that others feel a similar way because I'm so glad that you did not stop at, oh no, the book in order. I never realized that, I might have known how it kind of initially began from uh, knowing you, but I didn't know that that wasn't the idea really all along. And that's so cool that like to hear the story of the success now, but it didn't always begin that way. And you turned um, something that was like a no in a moment into a unique opportunity. Yeah, so it was actually, uh, so Manchester Bidwell is a center in Pittsburgh, and it's an awesome center, amazing, they do amazing work, um, and they provide arts classes for at-risk youth and job training for unemployed adults, and there's now, my last recollection, there's like 10 of them across the country, um, the closest being Cincinnati, and so we were going to try to have a, a, a branch here in Lexington, so actually for about three years, that was what we were pursuing. We had like every meeting possible. I met with everybody and their mother. We tried everything. But just coming at it from a grassroots angle, we just couldn't raise the kind of money you needed to like basically have a 
building from scratch. Um, so yeah, for, for about three years, it was like running into a brick wall until we're like, wait a minute, what if we just pivot slightly? Um, so yeah, it, it was, it's, it's been, it's been a fun journey. <laughs> Definitely. Well, actually, um, speaking of your journey and everything that led you to get here, um, in closing, I've got two questions that I wonder if others are dying to hear. <laughs> two major two questions. questions. <laughs> One, do you have any visions for expanding or do you see um, other different ways that you want to, uh, you know, going forward? Like a two year plan and just so cliche. What, what, what do you see yourself in two to five years? <laughs> but um, yeah. as it pertains to your organization, do you have plans of expansion? Yeah, so actually at the moment, we, we have one trailer in operation and then we have a second trailer that's being renovated. Um, so the hope is by the end of summer, um, we'll have two trailers that can be going out. Um, my hope is that we'll, able, we'll be able to one day stumble upon a big grant that would allow us to replicate this even more because again, it doesn't take that much money in terms of dollars that are usually spent on on things like this so um i can see like my vision would be in five years we'd have like five trailers all going out like there would be essentially almost like a bus system where we have a central hub and they just all go out and then they come back at night you know um that would be that'd be the hope so uh that's what i'm hoping wow well i would love to um see this be the case in other locations because I feel like there's so many children that can benefit from this and um, the children that you're able to work with right now and have them you know be able to do art in such a very like productive and creative way is like unprecedented this is so important and not just now because we're in a pandemic um, but always that can shape the mind and an ideology and just a person really and who they become mm. as they grow um and so i really appreciate you sharing that yeah this is uh, I, I was actually thinking that i asked a friend the other day um i was kind of marveling at the creative genius of pharrell <laughs> and i was thinking i made the comment i was like can you imagine if somebody like pharrell didn't have art class as a kid i like, like Pharrell is literally one of the most creative individuals of all time, one of the best producers of all time, um, and, and has transformed modern music. Can you imagine if they didn't have art class? Like, what if he didn't have the things that eventually sparked that? Right. You know, and that's the sad thing is that a lot of Title I schools don't have an arts program anymore because... You know, it's like, oh, well, it's not standardized testing and stuff. And it's like, good God, like, again, just think, like, imagine Pharrell never has art class. All he has is, like, math and science, which are important. I don't want to discredit those. But good God, there's so many creative people out there. And I know a lot of them got their start in tinkering around in different arts classes. So, so well said. that's just a thought I had. Yeah. And, no, I love that thought. Like, I, I completely think that's genius because... Goodness, it was it's an outlet for so many people and it could be an escape, you know, from harm or it can be a way to figure out something you never knew you had and and if all of it's taken away, then how do you go about kind of wiggling through life, you know, and searching in your yeah. avenues and for all of our creative geniuses out there today and just everyone has it in them to some degree. Yeah. For this to not even be in the norm is really sad and that it's just like seen as like a, a side thing and extra but really this is what gets our mind to feel alive <laughs> yeah totally yeah yep. so i think that's so oh man that's a really good example i definitely love the song happy and all the things <laughs> oh man yeah yeah um and so i wanted to really ask you for someone listening how can they get involved and in like what are ways that they can be like, uh, absolutely love this, and what can I do? What would you say for that? 
Yeah, I'd say, you know, there's the simple things like, of course, liking us on Facebook and following us on Instagram. You know, those, those show support. Um, then there's the next levels of um, we need lots of volunteers. So on our website, um, there's a tab that says get involved. Uh, and there's an avenue to get involved and to volunteer. So you can become a volunteer. You can send us a message through the website. We have like a little contact form. Um, so volunteering, um, if there's artists out there that would like to lead classes, uh, we are able to uh, provide small stipends to different artists who lead. Uh, and then of course donations, you know, we are a nonprofit. So anything from donating supplies to donating money, um, would be awesome we even have like a patreon account where you can sign up to give like two dollars a month to us um and it comes out automatically you know it's like a one-time thing and every my hope is we get like 200 people on there each giving like two dollars a month you know that'd be awesome uh patreon is what it's called um so i'd say those are some of the different ways is uh yeah just contact us and let's let's collaborate I absolutely love it and gosh, <laughs> this has been absolutely incredible I'm so glad I got to feature you and um, great work with everything that you've done and created with On The Move Art Studio I'm really excited to see what's more because already you've served and worked with so many children and there's definitely a need and I'm really glad I got to be able to, <laughs> to have you express the need so thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. I mean, it's, it's an honor to be on here. So thank you for what you're pursuing, Lauren. And, and thank you for having me on here and taking the time to uh, hear my story and, and take such good care of it. So thank you, Lauren. It's a pleasure. Well, really grateful for your time. And uh, again, this has been Josh Madsen speaking with me, Lauren. And he's representing On The Move Art Studio. And you can find out more information on www.onthemoveartstudio.org. So thank you, Josh.